welcome everyone out there to improving fire performance with fiberglass mat, part of our ongoing JM Engineered Products webinar series. My name is Tom Balcom and I'm the commercial director of our global non-wovens business. Fire prevention and fire protection are some of the most fundamental aspects of building regulations and codes. Fire regulations for building materials play a large role in making sure a building provides the intended level of fire protection for occupants and the structure itself. Today, I'm excited that we have with us Francis J.R. Babineau, Research Manager, Manager Building Science, Corporate R&D, and Ignacio Nunez, Nonwoven Technology Leader. They are experts in their fields, and I thank them for their contribution. Before we move ahead with the program, I have a few technical notes. This broadcast is being recorded. A link to the recording will be emailed out in the next few days. If you are wondering why you don't see hundreds of people in this Zoom seminar, don't worry. They are all listening. We have disabled participant visibility. Please use the Q&A feature to ask questions, and please ask lots of questions. I will collect them and will read them aloud to our speakers at the end of the presentation. Should you have any further questions after this event, we will provide you with the email addresses of JR and Ignacio at the end of their presentations. Now, just a few words on who we are. Johns Manville was founded in 1858. Today, we have over $4 billion of sales and 8,000 employees located throughout North America and Europe. We are a leading manufacturer and marketer of premium quality insulation and commercial roofing, along with glass fibers and non-woven products. Johns Manville has three divisions, roofing systems, engineered products, and insulation systems. Within engineered products, we have fiberglass, non-wovens, filtration and separation, and advanced composites. You can also see some of our brands that you may be more familiar with on the right-hand side of the slide. JM's engineered product business serves customers from 11 manufacturing facilities throughout North America and Europe with a wide range of fiberglass and technical non-woven products. Applications of our products include construction, building interiors, filtration and separation, automotive, consumer goods, and energy. That's all I wanted to tell you about us today. If you want to know more, please go to www.jm.com. With that, I wish us all one hour of an interesting learning experience, improving fire performance with fiberglass mat. J.R. and Ignacio, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you so much to everybody for just joining this webinar. So we will start already with, a, with a, a brief fire, fire introduction. Uh, we will just later on move to the different approach of the U.S. and Europe. Uh, finally, we will move already with the different fire testings we have. Um, and finally, we will just go to the questions and answers. So, as I said, the group is very heterogeneous, and I would really like to cover at the beginning some basics about fire. And I would just like to say back to the school. So maybe we can remember already at the school time that just to have a fire, we had already a kind of reaction called combustion. Yes, you have the flame. And for that, you have already, you need already a, a fuel and you need already a, an oxygen just to complete the, the combustion. In this case, you can see the flame, but from the moment on, just you remove the oxygen, the flame will just disappear. So this is one of the mechanisms we have already to just extinguish one fire. So I already said we can just cover the, the fire scenarios are covered by three different uh, categories. We have already the fuel, we have the energy, and we have the oxygen what we call already the triangle, the combustion triangle. Just by remo removing any of these elements, we will just extinguish the fire. And this will be just a strategy to follow just to prevent any kind of fire. Say that, and following this kind of triangle, we have already different possibilities. We have already oxygen scavengers, where we just capture the, the oxygen that is available in the environment. We can just reduce the oxygen concentration just by adding some other kind of inert gases. It will be just a kind of nitrogen release water release just from a chemical reaction. Or we can just use some kind of chemicals just removing some part of the energy of the combustion as you could really already see in the triangle. Finally, uh, another one, another mechanism to, to prevent some fire is just having a physical barrier to minimize the oxygen av availability in the oxidation reaction. It's just what we call intumescent material. 
You can see here below already two, two examples of different chemicals, for example, the nitrogen-based chemicals that in the decomposition reaction, you already absorb some, some energy. But later on, uh, just the decomposition of the ammoniac, you can just take oxygen from the, from the, from the fire, releasing nitrogen and water. And very similar with the metal hydroxides, you can just absorb some energy from the combustion reaction and just releasing some water. Good. Now, say that these were the basics, but now we have to understand what are the phases of one fire. In this case, we have already in the x axis the, the, the time, and in the y axis, we have already the temperature. Uh, we have already the ignition at the beginning of the, of the scenario of, of the fire, and in the first minutes, we have already the growth of the fire until we have the flash over. From that moment on, we will just have a fully developed burning scenario. And later on, when, later on, when the fuel is already away, we will just have the decay of the fire. So we are just talking about two different scenarios. We are talking about the reaction to fire, where we have already the growth of the fire. So and it's just the material, the fuel that the material is just providing to the fire to grow until we have the flash over. And after the flash over, what we have what we have already the resistance to fire. You can see already here in the picture, the resistance to fire is when the fire has been already completely developed, and then the structure will be in danger. So these scenarios are already defined by the regulations and the classifications of the different methods. Say that, we will start already with the first part of the scenario, the reaction to fire. The reaction to fire is really related to materials and not to, to systems. And in the reaction to fire, we have already a classification in Europe covered, covered by the 13501, where we have already from the A to the F, and the A1 and A2, they are related to non-combustible or limited combustible materials, just going, all, going through the plus over, in the, no plus over in the B material, covering the plus over before 10 minutes, after 10 minutes, or before two minutes. Then you can see already here a, a table where you can see already the different tests. You have to perform already the different, the different criteria to, to fulfill the, the, the certifications of the A1, A2, B, C, and D. You can see in most of them, you can repeat all, almost the same test. Uh, we are talking about the EN ISO 1716, and we are talking about the EN 13823. My colleague, JR, will cover as well the, the EN ISO 1124. So, we will start with the first of, of them. We are talking already for the non-combustible materials or limited combustible, and it's the EN ISO 1716, where we are talking about the PCS. And the PCS is just the calorific value of the material. In this case, it's measured in megajoules per kilo, and it's just the amount of energy that the material can just release into the fire scenario. The way we measure that is just we, put, we can put already the material inside this vessel, we just fill in already the whole vessel with oxygen, but we can have a complete oxygen combustion reaction. And from that moment on, we have here the ignition. Uh, we have already an explosion of the material, and all the energy release is transferred to the water around this vessel, and the difference of temperature is just uh, recorded. Just knowing already the difference of temperature of the water, we can just measure the energy that this material has. So just some examples we have already of the different PCS of different materials. We have some polymers like PET, that they have already 22 megajoules per kilo. Um, uh, PCS. Uh, we can just go to boxes, for example, that they are quite high, 37. They can go up to 40, 44 when we are talking about oils. And alcohol, in this case, would be something like 30 megajoules per kilo. How can glass help you? I mean, if we look already at the PCS values of the glass, glass is totally inorganic. So it does not have any PCS value. If we are talking about the glass non wovens, the glass non wovens, the way they are produced, they have already a chemical binder on it. And just this chemical binder will just provide this kind of um, energy. So that's why we are talking that the glass no one very roughly has something like five megajoules per kilo. Say that, I think it's quite easy to understand that uh, just using non wovens, glass non wovens, the final price will just have a positive contribution in the total PCS. If you have a material that is a kind of polymer like PET and you have 22 megajoules per kilo, just put in a certain amount of glass non-woven reinforced in the system, you will just decrease the total PCS of the, of the product. In this case, we will just cover the classification of non-combustible or limited combustible materials with the A1 and A2. Typical examples of this kind of materials, we are talking about mineral insulation, we are talking about ceiling tiles, you can see already in these pictures, or even some facade panels. 
normally, most of the files, they used to start always in one corner. And you can see already the paper bin, you can see already an office, uh, and you can see already that the file is just starting in one corner. So most of the tests, and later on, JR will just share with you as well in the US uh, approach will be quite similar with the, with the corner. We have the EN13823, and it's called the SBI. The SBI is the single burning item, and it's just simulating the conditions of one corner. On the right side, you can see already the, the, the bench where we measure the, the single burning item um, test. And it's just, you have already, you cannot see very well in this picture, but you have a burner that is providing the energy to the different construction materials that you have already in that corner. So the test criteria and the concepts that I will just elaborate a little bit further in the next slides are the lateral, lateral flame spread. We have the uh, flaming droplets particles, and we have the total heat release, fire growth rate, FIGRA. We have the total smoke uh, production. We have the smoke growth rate smoke. So the two first ones, they are very comprehensive. Uh, lateral flame spread is just the spread of the flame in this kind of bench. And of course, if you have droplets and if they are already falling down or not. But in the next slide, as I, as I already said, I will just try to describe already these kind of concepts that they are really more confused to understand for the rest of the people. We are talking about the FIGRA and the total heat release. You can see already in this graphic uh, two different curves. The first one that is just a kind of mountain going up and later down is just the energy release at any time. You can see already in the x-axis that you have the time. You have already 10 minutes, and the question will be, why 10 minutes? We are again talking about the reaction to fire. The reaction to fire is before the flash over. And normally, it's the time that you will have already to evacuate a building. So that's why the test, the test is just done in 10 minutes. In the y-axis, you can see already the heat release rate. It's measuring kilowatts. So at the beginning, you have already a lot of fuel, and it's increasing the, the, the heat release rate in kilowatts. And later on, when you are consuming already, the fuel is just decreasing, as you can see already in the graphic. On the other hand, you have another graphic that is a cumulative, cumul cumul cumulative one. In this graphic, is you are taking already the heat release rate at each moment, and you are just accumulating it until the end of the test. This accumulation will be in the end the, tot the total heat release measured in mega yields. And uh, the figure will be just described, and it's quite easy. So the figure will be just the vertical line starting from the x y, uh, from the y uh, axis, and if you can just start with the origin O point the o, the zero seconds zero minutes time, and when you start already going down the first point that you will touch the cube, this will be the slope we'll call the figure the fire growth rate. So these are the two concepts that are very important later on to understand how the glass no woman can help you already in a better classification for this kind of. Thing. So if we just go a, a, a little bit farther, you can see already three different curves with three different colors. You can see already in red, you can see already in blue, and you can see already in green. Any of them, they have different figures. As, as I already explained, you have the slopes, and you have different total heat release. Higher figures does, does, doesn't mean that you have higher, a higher total heat release, as we can see already in this example. So you can have already on the right side, you have already a graphic, but you can have already the classification of the different products and just the criteria you have. The criteria to have a product in one class classification is just coming from the two criteria, the total heat release and the figure. So you can see already that you have an area below in red that will be the B classification. You have an area below that will be the C classification and another area that will be the D classification. For the D classification, you can see that you don't have any limit for the total heat release. Now, coming again to this example, you can see already, already the, the, the red lines, right? The red lines, they have a pretty high figure. You can see already the slope. And you have the total heat release that is just falling in the middle of the blue and red one. If we can see already in this graphic, you can see already that the figure is here quite high. But we will be in the total heat release criteria to cover the B classification. But so far, the figure is quite high. We are already in the C classification. Something very similar to the blue line. The blue line has already a lower figure, but on the other hand, the total heat release is quite high. So you will be again in the C classification, but if you go to the red one and you can see that the figure slope is quite low and the total heat release as well is lower. So this red point will fall into the B classification. Why is this important to understand? Just because we have to really say that the glass non woven can help you already to improve already this kind of classification. So far, you have already here the red curves, the total heat release and the heat release rate. And you can see already the figure and the total heat release. 
from the moment that you just add any kind of glass non woven on top of this material, and really important as well in the back side, that you prevent that the fire is penetrating. And you can just delay this kind of cube. And the figure are just delaying some seconds to the right of this cube, you will see that the figure slope has already decreased. So you have already the red, the red one. And if you just put the glass non woven, you just move the graphic to the right side and you will decrease the figure. Very similar as well for the total heat release. From the moment that you are just moving the, shifting the, the curve, the total heat release will be below the 7.5 megajoules. That will be the criteria to be in the big classification. And just adding this kind of glass non woven, the two layers on the two sides of the different materials, you can just improve already the classification of your product. Say that, I will just move to the part of the curve where we are talking about the developed, fully developed fire. And we are talking about the resistance to fire. And the resistance to fire in this case is just indicating how long a construction can resist the fire after the flood over. And very important between two constructions, that you have two rooms, two buildings, and so on, that it will not affect to the other one. The classification in Europe will be the EN1363, and it's based on four different criteria. And the criteria you can see already here below is the integrity, the thermal insulation, the mechanical action, and the radiation. So here, what we will measure is just time, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, up to 240 minutes. And using the criteria of the integrity, you will see that you don't have any kind of flame just passing through the system. If you have a thermal insulation, that the heat is not passing through as well. The partition and the mechanical action is that, yes, the, the, the construction can withstand the load. So the test is quite quite easy. Uh, you have already a kind of bench. You put already the system you want to test. So the system can be just the beams, the, the metal beams. You can just put different, for example, different construction materials. You will put everything together. And what you are doing is just to heat up the, temper the temperature to 1,100 degrees Celsius. And you will just have a cube during the time. So it can be, as they said, from, from 15 minutes to up to 240 minutes. Very important in this kind of test is that you can reach already almost the 1,000 degrees uh, Celsius after seven minutes. And you are already at 800 degrees Celsius after something like 30, one, 30 seconds, one minute. Say that, uh, just imagine that you will have kind of loading beam here. You will just have a kind of protection. In case that you are using a glass non woven on top of that, just coat it with a thermal seal with a kind of product that will have a decomposition temperature about 1,200 degrees Celsius, like will be the case. You can see already that we will, we will never and never reach the temperature of 1,200 degrees Celsius. So this means that the product will stay there for a longer time. And this will give you just the chance to have a better classification in terms of time. Or even sometimes, as I already said, it is a system test. And if you have a system test, sometimes you have to put two layers of whatever construction materials on top uh, just to fulfill already the different building codes. If you have already just, for example, this kind of thermal fields, you can reduce the weight, you can reduce the cost, and in the end, you can just reduce the CO2 footprint as well for sustainable reasons. So say that, a very summary for the European approach, we have again the reaction to fire, just describing the, the materials, and the resistance to fire, just describing the time that the construction can withstand the situation. And with that, I will just hand over to my colleague, JR, and please, don't forget to start putting in the chat questions that we will just try to answer later on in the end of this webinar. So thanks so much. So JR, please. Thanks, Ignacio. So uh, the goals uh, for building fire codes in the United States are really around, similar to Europe, slowing the spread of the fire and giving people enough time uh, to get out of the building, right? We're not really trying to save the building or anything like that. It's slowing the spread of the fire. The assumption again is that buildings uh, or that fires start inside the building, uh, right? We're not really trying to protect buildings from fire attacking from the exterior with kind of some rare exceptions that we'll touch really briefly on. So to dive right into the test, um, the, the core uh, test or the kind of the starting point for any sort of fire testing in the US is combustibility. And the test method that we use in the US for that is called ASTM E136. And we can see in the photos here on the slide, especially on the right photo, it's simply a little tube furnace. 
that operates at 750 degrees C. This uh, middle upper photo kind of shows down into the throat of the furnace when it's uh, operating. And, uh, and, and again, this is just a material test. So you lower a small sample of the material in, you measure how it reacts over the course of 30 minutes, and then you can judge whether or not that material is considered combustible or not. And there's a very similar test in Europe called ISO 1182, uh, again, that's used to determine if a material would qualify as that class A1 or A2 classification under the European scheme. And really everything else uh, in terms of testing requirements flows from this test. So if a material is combustible, um, the real kind of dominant test method that's used in the United States to determine uh, what we call sp flame spread and smoke developed is a test method called ASTM E84. Uh, and it uses a, a device called a Steiner tunnel. And you can see here in the middle photo, a, a picture of the Steiner tunnel at JM. Um, this type of furnace actually was invented back in the 1940s. So it's been around for a long time and it's been in real common use uh, in reference by building codes since the 1960s. So we can see here on the right, actually a photo of what the inside of the furnace looks like with the lid up. Um, I will tell you, if you ever see an actual Steiner tunnel, they're never gonna be this white and pretty. Uh, we just happened to replace all of the, the fire bricks, all the refractory brick in ours uh, earlier this year. So I was able to take a picture of it before it ever got uh, sooty and dirty. And in this test, we use a, a natural gas burner, as we can see here in this upper middle photo uh, that puts out about 88 kilowatts of heat. Uh, the test lasts for 10 minutes and the test specimen actually covers the entire ceiling of the furnace, the entire top of the furnace. So it is about 24 inches or 610 millimeters wide and 24 feet long, uh, 7.3 meters or so. Um, and over the course of this 10 minutes, right, we're exposing the, the sample to fire. We're actually drawing a draft through the furnace as well uh, to kind of help pull the flame along just a little ways. And then beyond that, the operator looks through the ports uh, like in this upper photo here, and actually visually watches how far the flame spreads and marks that with uh, an indicator that we have attached to the tunnel. And so I think what I'm gonna do, play a couple of little video clips and kind of see an e a view from the end of the furnace uh, shot with my iPhone of, uh, of the, the burner, right? We can kind of see how the flame is hits the sample and then goes kind of away from us uh, during the course of the test. And then uh, over here, right, this is panning along down uh, the length of the tunnel where you can see after we go a little ways in this particular test, there's no more flame visible, right? So we wouldn't move the, the pointer down there, uh, but we can you know, see that as you get on down past, unless it's a sample that really burns a lot, you're not gonna necessarily see flame uh, farther down that way. The photo on the bottom shows what um, a sample could look like after it's been tested. This actually is a sample of foam plastic. And so we can see here at the left end, right by where the burner is, right, the material was completely consumed. And then as we move a little farther down, flames did spread kind of more to this middle section, but a little farther down still, right, the material has not burned. It's still discolored by the smoke and the heat, um, but we didn't actually get flame spread down there. And um, the criteria that we use uh, to measure flame spread is we basically compare how far the flame spread for a given sample to two other materials. So in the case of flame spread, we compare it to a fiber cement board, which is non-combustible, so that's zero flame spread. And then we also compare it against a sample of red oak flooring, uh, which is kind of our yardstick uh, by definition, that's 100 flame spread. And really everything gets compared between those two values. Similarly, uh, on the smoke measurement, we have a photo cell uh, farther down the draft tube and a, light, uh, and a light source where we measure how much smoke is produced simply by the reduction in, in light that the photo cell sees. And again, we compare it against the fiber cement board at zero and 
a heptane sample uh, that we burn once a year, which is our 100 flames or 100 smoke uh, kind of yardstick. And in general, in the US, we can see here at the bottom bullet point, right? What we're usually looking for is to see flame spreads being under a value of 25, um, and then to see smoke values to be um, hopefully less than 50 uh, for materials that are exposed to the interior of a building, or sometimes less than 450 if it's a material that might be uh, tucked away in the building envelope behind the gypsum board. So another large scale test that we use in the US is um, a, a corner burn test. So kind of similar to the single burning item, but it's a test that lasts a little bit longer. And this one is called NFPA 286. This is a 30 minute long test where again, we use uh, a natural gas burner tucked into a corner and then uh, the material that's being evaluated, right, is gonna be covering uh, the walls of the room and sometimes the walls and the ceiling of a room. And so initially, uh, we can see here in this first upper left photo, uh, we start with a 40 kilowatt burner after five minutes, that burner gets turned up to 160 kilowatts, so quite a bit more intense. And then the test goes for 30 minutes. And what we're really measuring in this particular uh, test is time to flash over. Uh, the test can also measure things like heat release rate and smoke, uh, but usually the key piece that we're interested in is time to flash over. And on the bottom two photos, we can see again, some of the benefits that we can see from uh, fiberglass non-wovens and how they can protect materials. So on the left photo uh, is uh, the material was a foam plastic and the facer of that foam plastic board was actually a fiberglass non-woven in addition uh, with a very thin layer of aluminum foil. And we can see that while, you know, the very corner of that material burned, right, it, it all didn't burn, right? There wasn't flashover in this particular case. Uh, this was a really successful test versus on the lower right-hand photo, uh, we can see kind of a different image. Now the test there is uh, kind of a variation on the NFPA 286, but it's still very similar. And this is some unprotected foam plastic, right? That particular test did not uh, pass. In the US, we do also have fire resistance tests um, where we're measuring, right, the time it takes for a wall assembly or a ceiling for ceiling assembly to resist a flame. And that test method is called ASTM E119. Similar to in Europe, um, we measure uh, both the ability to resist just the fire and the passage of temperature through the assembly, but also its ability to resist load. So the drawing on the top uh, would be an example of uh, a wall furnace that would be used for this sort of test where a large wall assembly would be placed in front of the, the mouth of the furnace and be subjected to uh, a, a, you know, flames and high temperatures. The photo down here in the middle um, is an example of a similar furnace, but for a floor ceiling assembly. And again, the, the outcome of these tests would be a rating in minutes, whether that's 60 minutes, 90 minutes, 120 minutes, uh, 180 minutes, et cetera. We also have got a, a system level test in the US for roofing assemblies. Uh, and that would be the lower right-hand photo. That that's uh, test method ASTM E108. And again, this is one of those, it's really more of a, a spread of flame test, even though it is a system level test where we're looking to see, right, when we have a roof covering, whether that's shingles or membranes, whatever it might be, plus the insulation that might be below that. Uh, and we wanna see, right, does that material propagate a spread of flame uh, or not during the course of the test? One of the more significant tests that we do have in the US, um, which is really a, this combination of fire resistance and spread of flame is NFPA 285. And this is done on exterior building walls uh, for multi-story buildings. And really the, the point of this test is to evaluate an exterior wall system. And this is all the way from the cladding through the structure back to the interior uh, cladding of the wall. Uh, and what we're trying to avoid here are the situations that led like to the Grenfell Tower disaster, right? We don't, so the, the, uh, the drawing in the middle, let's start there, right? So this is a side view of the test setup where we have got a lower room 
um, where we're going to say the fire starts. And then this is, we're assuming this is a multi-story building. So the wall itself is two stories tall. We have an upper room and we have a window space. And the top photos give some examples, right? Show kind of the, again, this is a full system test. So on the left upper photo, we see the back view of the wall where we've got, in this case, steel framing. We can see the gypsum board uh, for the interior finish of the wall. And then over in the upper right, uh, in this particular instance, uh, we've got foam sheathing uh, as the as some exterior insulation. And then actually that gets covered in this case with a metal panel for the facade. And the way this test works is for the first five minutes, again, we've got a burner just on the inside of the room that's going. So that would be this lower left photo. Um, and then after five minutes, the assumption is the window has failed, the glass is broken, and now that fire can escape the room and attack uh, the bottom, right, attack the head of the window opening and potentially get up into the wall system, which of course is not what we want to happen. But so at five minutes, uh, this window burner is ignited and then things start to happen, um, right? So in this case, we can see the fire is attacking the bottom of the foam. It's kind of melting through the cladding panels, right, and spreading upwards. And then these, uh, the last two photos on the, on the right are really after the 30-minute test where we can see, right, that in this particular case, the fire has spread vertically, um, not really much uh, laterally, but vertically it is definitely spread. And the way we determine a pass or a fail in this test is that as the wall assembly is built, there are literally dozens of thermocouples installed throughout the, the wall assembly, um, up in the upstairs room. And there are various criteria for these uh, thermocouples. Uh, we see here on the slide, right? Some can hit a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Some we look at how much the temperature rises on these thermocouples. And the idea is that by measuring these temperature rises, we can infer how far the flame is spread in the wall system, even if it's in an area that we can't see. And again, the idea here is we want to make sure, right, that people have time to get out without the fire spreading to upper stories. So some of the last tests that we're going to cover uh, and talk about today, this is going back now to a material scale test. So uh, ASTM E1354, uh, which is called the cone calorimeter, is again a small scale material test. I'm going to go ahead and play the video while I talk. And you can see, right, that this is, it's a small sample. It's about four inches by four inches square. And when we ignite this, the material, we're able to measure, again, heat release rate. So similar to the single burden item test, but at a much smaller scale. And uh, this is a, really a useful tool in the U.S. more for research and development and product development. Uh, the graph that I've got uh, shown here in the slide is showing heat release rate, again, on the vertical axis, time on the horizontal. And we can see a couple of different samples that we had burned in the cone calorimeter where, uh, for example, the blue curve uh, is, has one particular facer on it um, where we can see that the peak heat release, peak heat release rate sorry, was a certain value, um, right? But then the, uh, the overall right, is a little bit higher and then with an alternate facer, we might end up having maybe a higher peak, but a lower overall heat release rate. And with these values, we can gauge, you know, how well is a facer doing to help um, manage the ignition and the burning of a material? How well does a fire retardant package that may be put into uh, like a foam plastic, right? How well do these materials perform in terms of controlling the heat release, managing the smoke release, uh, things like that? Yes, so Ignacio. JR said it's very similar to the SBI, so we are measuring almost the same. So we have the heat release rate per, per time, and the, the graphics are very similar. In, in this case, you can see already that uh, we are talking about the way we are applying the energy. Exactly. Yes, a cone, and you don't have just in one corner. So sometimes there are some softwares, commercial softwares, that they can just to predict how this will behave in the SBI, but we have just to consider the limitations of the test. And as already JR said, uh, it's a very good tool for development purposes just to know already how it will behave later on in further testing for fire. Exactly, exactly. Great point, Ignacio. And so just a few more tests that we do in the US. Again, there's 
We have a lot of different tests. Most of them are, are pass fail uh, versus the classification system that the Europeans use. But uh, one of the the next test that I was going to cover real briefly is on air handling ducts. So we have a specific test in the U.S. Uh, for um, duct work for air handling. Uh, it's called UL181, and it is a, uh, a, a, uh, a flame penetration test. So you can see here in the video and in this other right-hand photo, we have a what we call a pit furnace that operates at about 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. We suspend the material um, over, uh, over the top of this furnace, and then we actually suspend an eight-pound weight on top of the, the material as well. So right in this case, this is just fiberglass with some very thin facers on it, and it has to support this weight for 30 minutes over the course of the, over the, this flame, and the weight can't fall through, and we can't develop any little holes where, uh, where the flame might peek through there. Uh, the drawing here in the middle is another test where actually this is one of the examples where we actually do look at wall assemblies of uh, getting exposed to fire from the outside. And this would be for any sort of building that is built in what's called the wildland urban interface, right? So the edges of cities where buildings are built kind of tucked up against nature, uh, right? And they might experience wildfire exposure. Of course, over the last few years, right, we've all heard about, you know, a lot of wildfires in the Western part of the United States. Also, a lot of wildfires have happened in the last few years in Europe as well uh, due, to, uh, due to drought. So this is increasingly becoming an important uh, criteria for buildings built in these areas. And then finally, um, just measuring smoke density and smoke toxicity uh, is an important measure for materials, especially that go into transportation and aerospace applications. Uh, right in these sort of uh, structures or, or vehicles, right, we have usually a lot of people and they're in a very confined space. And you know, recognizing that most injuries and fatalities uh, in a fire aren't from the fire, they're from the smoke, uh, is why uh, these sorts of tests are very important. And finally, right, I've, I've mentioned a few times how uh, Johns Manville has got some different fire testing capabilities in-house. And so I just wanted to highlight again at the end uh, what we actually have at the Johns Manville Technical Center in Littleton, right? We have, uh, as I mentioned, a Steiner tunnel for ASTM E84. Uh, we also have a tube furnace, which can run either ASTM E136 or ISO 1182 for combustibility. Of course, we have a cone calorimeter uh, for R&D purposes, as well as a flame penetration furnace and a smoke density chamber. And while we also, while we use these uh, extensively for our own research and development and product development, these are also available to our customers, right? If you uh, contact your business contact, uh, we may be able to assist uh, our customers as well in, uh, in getting approvals or uh, just in doing some research and development uh, when it comes to fire performance. And expertise. Yes, absolutely. And... With that, I think we're open to the Q&A section. Yes, please do submit your questions uh, through the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And I think with that, uh, we'll have Tom read off any questions that have come in. All right, thanks gentlemen. So the first question, if the majority of fires start in corners, why would it be important to have fire resistant properties in facade? I think that go. I'll let you go first, Ignacio. Okay, no, I think see that's if I want to add in. <laughs> no, I mean because again, we are talking about the first part of the fire development. Uh, once you have a plus over, uh, these kind of fires can just already JR uh, so already in the NFPA two eighty five. Yep. So they will just go through, and in the end, you will just attack the facade. So that's why it's very important. And the greenfield, it was something very similar. It was. So uh, it started already inside the building, and it started already to spread it out of the of the facade. So that's why it's very important as well to consider the, the performance of the materials for the facade. Exactly, yes, that's exactly what I've said to you, right? It's, it's a combination, right? We want to give people to evacuate. So slowing it down in the room is one thing, but if it happens to get out, we don't want it to run up the outside of the building and, and you know, have a, a, a tragedy. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is around gypsum drywall. Um, so we know that gypsum drywall uses paper and cardboard. We also know that there's applications where gypsum uses glass. 
So what's the contribution of using the glass facer in improving the fire resistance? So is, it, is there any data that helps us understand that better? Okay. So maybe I'm more familiar to that yep. kind of market. Um, the gypsum normally is a product is just a, a one, a two. So from the reaction to fire point of view, it's not a big difference to use paper, to use glass non-woven. Once again, we are coming again to the resistance to fire. When you have already what I ex already explained in my slide, when you have already a kind of sealed, and this will be the case, you have a sealed, that this sealed is just a glass no woven already coated with a high performing material that will just can uh, with withstand 1,200 degrees. From that moment on, the paper cannot just will burn, as I already said, in the first 30 seconds, the paper will burn. Meanwhile, if you have a glass non woven with a coated, with a coated material that will, will withstand 1,200 degrees, the structure of the gypsum plate will stay. And that's why it's very important, these kind of applications that use glass non-woven with a coated technology like JM technology. And that, to, the, to the data question, I'm sure there's databases in Europe as well, but I know in the US, um, if someone were to look at like, there's like United Underwriters Lab, the UL has got a large catalog of wall assemblies. And if you were to kind of pick your way through that and look at wall assemblies that maybe only have a 60 minute rating versus 120 or 180 hour ratings or 180 minute ratings almost exclusively, right? The, the wall assemblies with these longer resistance values have glass fibers either in the core or non-woven, right? Or both, right? So just kind of your regular gypsum board isn't up to the task. It's important to say, as I, say, as I said, and that sometimes what you say, UL, they have already a catalog of different setups. Uh, sometimes you can just cover the same having two layers of gypsum board, for mm -hmm. example. But if you use already glass non woven, you can just reduce instead of using two, could be that you can use only one. So you will have already a kind of impact in cost, transport, CO2 footprint, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So the, the next topic is SBI classification. So you talked about this earlier. So what would be the best approach to improve SBI classification for a panel board used in ventilated facades? Okay. Uh, once again, when you have already the SBIs, you have two criteria. We have the total heat release and mm -hmm. we have the FIGRA value. So depending on already how the product you have already in the market is performing, we have really to evaluate the graphic I was showing already in my previous slide and just to see already how is it performing. Can be just a product has a high FIGRA, but a small total heat release. For example, the poly ISO board, they have a very huge FIGRA, but the total heat release is very small because the material has been compressed. So you really have to look at any individual situation and just with that evaluate already how is the, it performing and to just try to have what is the best approach to use a glass non-woven just on the surface, on both surfaces, or just even in the middle to have a kind of in-between layer. Thank you. Um, so the next question. Um, so can you share some experience with bitumen torch on membranes uh, using your single material fiberglass, which goes into the bitumen composite membranes. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That gets very specific. Um, you know, honestly, that that is one. If we can be sure to capture who put that in, let me get back to you because I will probably circle around to some roofing folks. I mean, I know when it comes to roofing and bitumen membranes, at least in the U.S., we, it's more this E108 uh, test assembly where again it's a roof system level test and certainly the the reinforcing layers that are in the the membrane definitely play a role um and so uh i know it's got to be important but but i don't know the detail that so i don't want to give a made-up answer but we can definitely get back to that person i well, appreciate question. that okay so one, another question so this goes back to uh, predicting large-scale fire tests. So can you talk more about predicting a large-scale fire test results from your small-scale tests? Well, I think as Ignacio mentioned, we were talking about the cone calorimeter. That's kind of the main tool that I'm aware of that's out there is where you can, there's been a lot of research done in Europe to correlate uh, the results from the cone calorimeter to the single burning item test, the larger scale test in, in Europe. In the United States, I would, it's not as clear cut. I know at JM, we've been trying to do this, trying to connect the dots between the cone calorimeter and maybe the ASTM E84 uh, flame spread values. 
And, you know, one of the main things you discover is that fire, trying to scale results in fire is a challenge. <laughs> my, my experience on that is yeah, just very similar. So the cone calorimeter, small scale, uh, very good for, for, for R&D. And later on, you can just move to the SVI. We could see already that the graphics, they are the same, not similar, they are the same. So heat release rate and just time. Uh, we have really to consider that uh, the way we are applying the energy, I already said, is a cone you have on the whole surface. Meanwhile, the SVI is just starting uh, from one corner. It's very important, for example, in the SVI that there are the real conditions of the real test. Very important in the mechanism is the way the flame is penetrating. In the cone calorimeter, you have already applying the energy from the top part until everything is combusted. Mm -hmm. When you have already the SVI, you can see already that the flame is going through and a very critical point is when the flame has gone through the whole material, you have already two sources of flame in front of the material and behind. From that moment on, you can see already in the cube that is really increasing the heat release rate at that mm. time. Say that, you have to be very careful just extrapolating the results from the calorimeter to the SBI. And what I could just say based on my experience, it was it, if a product at the calorimeter will not pass, will not pass at the SBI for sure. If a, if a product will pass the cone calorimeter test, it's just a maybe at the SBI. Sure. So. All right, well, thank you. So this next one's around flooring and binders. So does changing binder composition on a glass mat, will that have an impact on the flame resistance of say a carpet or any other product where the mass contribution from glass substrate is quite small? Would you? All right. Uh, yes, definitely yes, will not be the main contributor. That's right. Uh, what I already said as well in the graphics, I saw already. Uh, sometimes we are talking about, and my experience is mm -hmm. just sometimes some kind of material did not pass the classification just because three seconds. So maybe the contribution of the glass and woven is quite small, but three seconds are always two seconds. And this could be the classification one or classification two. And that's why it's never and ever un underestimate the glass non-woven that will be in the final product. And I fully agree. I mean, the contribution is very small. It's full of polymers, mm -hmm. but sometimes, of course, it will help to be just in the right application. That's a very exactly. good question, by yeah, the way. Good question. Okay. Um, got another question just came in. So in roofing systems, is there a relationship between the cone calorimeter and the different test of ASTM E108? I would say yes. Um, again, this is one of those that, um, the correlations are not always robust, let's say. But, but I know, right, at JM, uh, certainly as if we are, anytime we're developing right, new formulations for membranes for low slope roofs, we absolutely test them in the cone multiple times, right, before they ever get scaled up to a, to a full scale E108 test. So certainly, again, you know, um, membranes, right, where the formulation has lower heat release rates, um, are going to perform better. Again, it, it gets to be this question of, you know, can you for sure say, you know, a, a number in the cone will re result in a pass in E108? Again, if it's a really good number, right, it's a very low heat release rate, then yes, you can make that kind of assumption or inference pretty confidently. If it's a little more at the edges, um, then that becomes much harder, right? Again, the, the correlations are not really robust. Yeah, I know, at least internally at JM, we are working to have those be better so that we can make our own predictions more reliably as we move forward. Great question. Another question has come in. So uh, SBI has quite significant variability. So has ASDM E84 almost the same uncertainty or variability? I would say yes. Um, I mean, to, uh, but the variability in ASDM E84 it's really driven by the materials. Um, uh, you know, so the variability is not so much from, let's say the operator, uh, right. Or just the inherent in the test itself. It, most of the variability does come, uh, from materials. So if, and to give kind of some examples, right. If it's a material that is very flammable, where the flame spread number is, you know, high, let's, let's say, you know, above 50 or approaching a hundred, um, I'm just trying to think back a little bit to materials that I've seen, right? The, the range in those numbers, uh, when it's high, right, might be plus or minus 10, 
flame spread and the flame spread rating, um, right? When it's something very low, that does actually, it, when it's something low, the variability might still be plus or minus five. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, if your target is, let's say 25, right? Uh, <laughs> right, you almost means you need to design your material to hit 15 if you wanna reliably be below that 25 number, right? There is some variability there. And of course, as the number gets smaller, that from a percentage perspective makes more difference. Yeah, I mean, coming back to the SBI is the same. I mean, just for the certification, you have to run three tests because the variation is already known. And in case that there is one product, mm -hmm. one, one test that is not fulfilling the classification you want to achieve, you can perform five tests in the end. Okay. So you can just increase to have five different tests, five different numbers just to get, get the classification. Interesting, in, in the US, um, there's not a requirement to do replicate <laughs> testing. <laughs> so you can just, you know, test and test and test and get your one good result and you can be done now. Yeah. As an engineer, I don't recommend that, um, but but the reality is that uh, that that's all you need is one one good test in the U.S. to get a you know something to go onto your code approvals report. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thanks. So we have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, there are several others, and for those questions that were submitted, we we will get answers back out uh, as we had on the other. But this last question: so if you think beyond construction markets, so could a glass non-woven be used to increase fire resistance? Let's just say in furniture applications or something else? Definitely, uh, for sure. So we, are, we were just focused on the construction materials, but this kind of approach can have a, an impact in any other kind of type of products you can find already in the market. So for sure, furniture will be a, a good application, good market that uh, the people could think about. And of course, we are always there to, to provide the best solution and to provide the best, uh, the best approach to solve the problem. Right. Well, with that, thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for the excellent questions. If you have any more questions or questions you were, uh, I don't know, too ashamed to send in on the Q&A, please e email us. Uh, Ignacio or I can, uh, can get, get you answers to those. And thank you, everyone, for attending. We really appreciate it.